by West Australian company CBH. It's Australia's largest grain uh, exporter and it's been suspended from sending its barley into China. Now, Reuters is reporting that China made this decision after, quote, quarantine pests were found in multiple shipments. Now, the company denies this allegation. It says that it's retested its cargoes uh, and that they meet Australian export standards. Now, uh, it is working with the Australian government to see if it can have this uh, suspension overturned. Of course, this is only the latest trade blow to hit Australian agricultural producers in the last few months. Earlier this year, China imposed an 80% tariff on Australian barley exports. Uh, it also has suspended or banned, rather, uh, a number of Australian beef abattoirs from sending their products to China. And in the last two weeks alone, we've seen two investments investigations launched into Australian wine producers with accusations that they're unfairly dumping the product into the Chinese market and that they're being unfairly subsidised by the Australian government. In responding to this latest suspension, the Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, said that Australian barley is highly regarded around the world, but he wouldn't say uh, whether or not uh, China's motivations behind this were politically motivated. He said he's taking their claims at face value. It's a highly regarded company in my home state of uh, Western Australia, which uh, has got a great track record when it comes to exporting high-quality uh, grain products. Um, Look, I mean, we respect the fact that uh, China, like any other country would, like we do, has got uh, quarantine inspection arrangements and uh, you know, we will be working with the company uh, once we are aware of all of the facts to make the appropriate representations. Now, the relationship between Canberra and Beijing this year has been frosty. Uh, a number of federal government MPs have not been able to get hold of their Chinese counterparts, neither the Agriculture Minister David Littleproud or the Trade Minister Simon Birmingham have had their calls returned. The opposition leader Anthony Albanese has accused the Morrison government of mishandling Australia's relationship with China. And it's a, a real issue, I think, that Australian ministers uh, can't pick up the phone and seem to have no relationship with their Chinese counterparts. Uh, China is uh, the largest uh, recipient of our exports uh, by, by a long way. And it is of real concern that the Australian government don't seem to be able to manage the relationship. That's the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, there responding to the latest trade blow from China, this time against Australia's largest grain exporter. Thanks, Noor. Donald Trump has blamed domestic terror for the days of violence that followed the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. The US president ignored requests to stay away from the Midwestern city and toured areas damaged in the riots. He backed law enforcement as part of his key election pitch for law and order. North America correspondent Catherine Diss reports. No communism, USA! <laughs> From the moment the president arrived, the city's deep divisions were on full display. Trump supporters facing off against Black Lives Matter protesters. This city has become the latest flashpoint in America's reckoning on race. Another fault line between those calling for racial justice and those wanting peace on the streets. But you can also come out of your house into the streets and have your voice to be heard. I was asked the other day by somebody saying, do you think it's, do you think it's good that Trump's coming? I said, yeah. They're like, well, don't you think it's going to cause dissension? I go, have you seen our city? Donald Trump walked through the ruins against the wishes of local leaders who feared his presence would ignite more violence. So this store was here 109 years, just about the oldest in the nation doing what oldest you did. in the state, for sure. Yeah, it's fantastic. And we're going to help them a lot. He met police and praised their efforts to quell the unrest. These are not acts of peaceful protest, but really domestic terror. It was the police shooting of Jacob Blake that sparked the protests. The president didn't meet with his family because they wanted their lawyers present. 
We don't have any words for the orange man. All I ask is that um, he keep his disrespect, his foul language far away from our family. Absolutely. We need a president that's going to unite our country and take us in a different direction. The president, though, focused on the looting and burning, declaring the violence anti-American. It's just a deflection. You know, it's just like, oh, look at this property damage. But look at the fact that this cop shot this man. I think what has happened over the last week has just shown how deep the racism that exists in this country is and how it shows up in any town from Chicago to Kenosha. You would expect a president to visit a battleground state, but the cocktail of tensions playing out in Wisconsin offered Donald Trump a platform to reinforce his campaign message of law and order and shift the narrative away from the coronavirus pandemic. The president is claiming victory for stopping the violence in Kenosha, but some say his visit is only further polarising American society. Catherine Dix, ABC News, Washington. Classrooms across Europe are reopening for the new school year. Despite a recent surge in coronavirus cases, tens of millions of pupils are returning after the summer break and months of homeschooling. Some of the hardest hit countries in the pandemic, France, Spain, Italy, Russia and England, have reopened schools under new restrictions. Hand cleansing stations, social distancing and staggered playtime have been introduced in many countries. Time to check the weather now with Nate Byrne. It's a windy day through the southeast of the country as a frontal system pushes through. It's not bringing much in terms of rainfall. It's really all about the damaging wind gusts for parts of South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. And beyond those areas where we've got severe weather warnings, it's still going to be quite gusty with raised dust for western New South Wales, getting into the southwest of Queensland as well. Not much rain out of this. It's fairly isolated in terms of the falls. The rest of the country is looking fairly dry and that picture is going to continue for the rest of the week with falls at times for parts of the south as weak fronts and troughs move through. But on the weekend we'll see the next major system making it into the southwest. And that'll start dragging heat down from the north once again into the southeast of WA for Sunday. Before that though, we've still got quite a lot of warmth around Brisbane, not really feeling it. Partly cloudy and 25 on Thursday, but for Sydney, sunny and 29. Even Canberra's not that cold. 20 for you, shower or two around, and Melbourne will see a couple of showers developing as well, a top of 19. 18 on the way for Hobart with just a possible couple of falls. Uh, Adelaide will see some showers clearing, 17 there. Perth, cloudy, but it should stay dry. You're aiming for 20, and for Darwin, it's a sunny day with a maximum of 34. And viewers on ABC TV are leaving us for the National Press Club address now. You can, of course, keep up to date with all latest news over on the ABC News channel. Top stories on ABC News. Official figures have confirmed that Australia is experiencing its first recession in almost 30 years because of the pandemic. The Bureau of Statistics says the economy contracted by 7% in the June quarter. Gross domestic product also shrank over the March quarter. A recession is marked by two consecutive quarters of economic contraction. Victoria's weekly average for new coronavirus infections has fallen below 100 for the first time since early July. 90 cases have been detected since yesterday, marking the third consecutive day of double-digit increases in the state. However, six more people have died. Early this morning, Victoria's upper house passed a bill to extend the state of emergency for another six months. There have been 17 new cases recorded in New South Wales. Eight infections are linked to the Sydney CBD cluster and six are part of the cluster at St Paul's Catholic College at Greystains in the city's west. One case has no known source, while another is in hotel quarantine. The 17th case is linked to Liverpool Hospital. And AFL officials are expected to confirm the 2020 grand final will be held in Brisbane. COVID-19 means the decider will have to be moved outside Victoria for the first time. About 400 officials and players flew to the Sunshine State yesterday. Let's get more now on today's GDP figures, showing Australia's economy shrank by 7% in the June quarter. Here's Danielle Wood from the Grattan Institute. These figures are historically unprecedented. Uh, it does reflect you know, partly how sharp this recession has been, um, so, you know, so we have had full, big falls in the past, but normally we've eased into it more slowly. 
you know, this has been like flicking a switch, um, essentially because governments made the decision to, you know, shut down swathes of the economy. Uh, we just saw household consumption go through the floor and, you know, those are incredibly <laughs> significant numbers. Look, I think the approach has largely been successful. I mean, you can certainly quibble at the edges, but, you know, the centrepiece has been that job keeper scheme. Uh, it, it has delivered on its goal, I think, of, you know, keeping people attached to their employers, giving businesses a lifeline and giving them the hope for coming out on the other side, as well as, you know, pumping sizable amounts of money into the economy. You know, one of the really interesting figures coming out in these national accounts is that household savings ratio is up, you know, almost at 20%. Um, so, you know, consumers' income has been flowing largely because of those government supports. People are not feeling confident to, to go out and spend, and you can see that in the massive fall in consumption. Uh, but some of that money is still sitting there in terms of savings. So I think the, the uh, approach to date has been good. You know, big questions, though, about what we look like in the world post the end of September as those supports start to taper off. What we know um, from, from the, the real-time spending data is, is people... Um, are starting to spend more and some of the jobs are coming back uh, in some of those other states. But of course, Victoria is going to put a substantial drag on that. Um, and then in the final quarter of the year, you know, beyond that September, when the supports are eased off, uh, what we're going to see is a contraction from government stepping back um, if, if they don't announce significant changes in the October budget. And that remains to be seen. Um, there, there will be a, a big pullback in terms of government support. So that's another danger zone for the economy that final three months of the year. Danielle Wood there. And we are expecting the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, to speak about those GDP figures in about half an hour's time. We will bring you that to you live as soon as it begins. Let's take a closer look at today's coronavirus figures now. Here's ABC analyst 